Welcome to the World Radio Communication Conference 2023 in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, where I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio this morning by Joanne Wilson, who is Deputy Director of the Radio Communication Bureau. Joanne, welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Now, ITU has had a number of firsts in, on the journey towards gender equality and mainstreaming in, in tele and radio communications and information and communication technologies. Last year, as we know, Doreen Bogdan Martin was the first woman elected to lead ITU, historically uh, shattering a 157 year old glass ceiling. Most recently, Carol Wilson, uh, the 2023 Radio Communication Assembly chair, became the first woman to lead the significant proceedings. Prior to that, in fact, of course, we'd had Vina Rawat 20 years ago, uh, who led uh, the uh, World Radio Communication Conference. And we also had female chairs of uh, WCSA and uh, amongst others. In the wake of this, there's also been some good news. As we know, uh, a resolution on gender at the Radio Communication Assembly was approved. I wanted to ask you, what impact do you think this resolution will have? Uh, it could have, and hopefully will have, um, a big impact if the member states and sector members take to heart and implement the actions called for. Um, our challenge, in, particularly in radio communications, is that we don't have enough women in the field in general. So while we work hard to try to increase their participation in our study groups and the conference and so forth, we're hindered by the fact that there are too few women in radio communications, in electrical engineering and computer science, which are the, 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 the fields that then lead to people participating as, as engineers in, in, in these conferences. Uh, so hopefully the measures that are put forth, um, encouraging uh, young women to go into these fields, um, providing scholarships and, and uh, um, uh, also fellowships or, or or internships, summer jobs, you know, other measures to and even going back as far as, you know, looking at girls' education and make sure that they have what's necessary to go into engineering as a discipline. Um, all those measures will have a big impact. So, so we'll see. It really depends on um, going, moving from a resolution to action. Because it's really, in principle, quite slow progress. I mean, ITU 25 years ago, I believe, uh, uh, passed a, uh, a gender resolution at the plenipotentiary conference. Essentially, this is I mean, a clear signal to member states to really to start taking notice of this. Is that, is that how you would see it? Yeah, and, uh, and some progress has been made. We are seeing you know, more women at this conference um, participating as chairs, um, as counselors and, and, and so forth. So we are seeing progress. We had um, a lot more women in uh, leadership roles in the, in the preparatory process, particularly the regional level. I think all of that has been um, promoted by and, in, uh, and enhanced by the, the efforts from the WRC 19 uh, gender declaration. Uh, so I think that all that's positive momentum. Uh, but at the end of the day, we can't get to equity and parity in a field if, uh, if only 20 some percent of the participants in the field are women. So then, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get to 50 percent, you know, equity, equality and so forth at the higher levels, you know, in, in, if you're not have a, if you don't have enough at the base. OK, let me come back to that. You've got degrees in engin electrical engineering. You've worked in technology for many years. You, uh, you have an important role in the United Nations Specialized <laughs> Agency with a prime focus on tech. What would you say are some of the career obstacles uh, that face women in, te in the technological fields today? Well, let me start with changing the question a little bit of what, what are some of the things that helped me uh, to get to my level and then some of the obstacles I think women face. Okay. So what helped me was I had a scholarship from Bell Laboratories that, you know, for undergrad, I had a fellowship for graduate school. Um, I had summer jobs. I, so the things that I talk about as being essential are things that I benefited from. I even had, I even benefited from participating in a program that MIT did when I was a junior in high school that, you know, introducing kids to engineering. So there's a lot of things that I benefited from that were available then that may or may not be available today. So that, those are the things that just sort of got me into engineering. Um, and then career-wise, you know, I've always benefited from being, um, having good mentors, um, uh, executives who thought that I had some potential and were willing to open, create some opportunities for me. 
Um, I benefited actually from the fact that um, I stand out in a crowd. <laughs> And so, and so when I open my mouth, usually people remember who said who said something because I'm, you know, I'm typically the only woman, or often the only woman, often the only person of color, often the only both of those in a room. So to be honest, I actually benefited from the fact that, you know, if I if I open my mouth, if I have some um, views and I express them, if I say them in a way that people you know, sit up and take notice, they'll I'll probably be remembered. So, and so in that standpoint, I'd say one of the obstacles is to not let what appear to be obstacles be obstacles. Sometimes they're actually advantages. And what sparked your interest? <laughs> Was it uh, circumstances around you? Was it something that just that happened at school? Was it a teacher? Was it what, what actually got you on that path? Well, uh, that program at MIT, okay, so that was the first one. Um, in fact, I didn't even know what MIT was, let alone to know that it was the top engineering school in the world, uh, until uh, I was sort of there on campus going, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. Uh, and the only reason I went to that program was because I had a high school teacher who came into our math class one day and put a, you know, application on everyone's desk, said, fill this out and give it back to me. And I will, and uh, she didn't even explain what it was all about. And then I got a message saying, congratulations, you've been accepted into the, you know, into this program at MIT. We look forward to seeing you this summer. Your airline ticket will be on its way. I'm like, whoa. So I benefited most from the fact that I had a, you know, a, amazing mom and dad who, who, you know, always encouraged me and, you know, recognized I was, you know, good at math and so forth, but also made me do my homework. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and when I was six, still, I found my, my mother would contact the teacher and find out what assignments is, or do you have while she's home sick. And then when I went to school, I had to turn in my homework, even though I was, had been out sick. So, <laughs> so mom was kind of uh, pushy. Well, <laughs> Great mom. <laughs> exactly. It was good to hear. It, it definitely paid, paid off in the end. I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give other women, and especially the younger generation, who are looking for opportunities to advance their careers in the radio communication sector and, and, or other technological fields? Um, I guess probably the, the biggest thing is to recognize that um, the, there's nothing gender specific about math and physics and science. If you put in the work, if you, edu you know, these are exciting fields, they're interesting, and, and there's no reason why women can't be as good or better in these fields than, than anyone else. So, so you know, because I oftentimes talk to, to girls who today seem to be, to feel like they're, they're somehow or another, boys are better at math than them or something like that. And, and, and I almost want to, like, let me break the myth. They're not that smart. <laughs> They're no smarter than you. <laughs> you know, so just go for it, and uh, and you'll see it's a great it's a great field, great opportunities, a lot of fun. If you if you're interested in in um, you know doing big things, I spent um, part of my career working for NASA, and if you want to see um, like look at mission control at any, any national mission, and it's extremely diverse. You see men and women, all, all ages, all you know, from different backgrounds and so forth, and they are having a blast because they are doing something together that is phenomenal. And then you see when something you know, happens that's great, like when, like when the, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope opened and they were finally able getting images from it, you know, the whole room is high-fiving and so forth because it's a tremendous achievement and, and it's fun and everybody's a part of it. Um, that's the kind of environment that you can be in in engineering. You can do really big, really great things and have a whole lot of fun doing it. And so, you know, I, I, I say, tell the girls, don't, don't let the boys have all the fun. <laughs> you know, get in there, enjoy yourself. It's a, it's a blast. Yeah. Well, I couldn't agree with more. I've got two daughters, and uh, and that's exactly what I say to them too. That's brilliant. Well, Joanne, thank you so much for sharing these <laughs> wonderful insights and recollections with us, and uh, and hopefully we'll catch up with you again very soon. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you've enjoyed this interview, which I'm sure you will have, then do check out our other interviews on our YouTube channel as well as podcasts on our podcast channel, SoundCloud, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts from. And for further information. 
why not visit our website at www.itu.int. Thanks for tuning in.